And now I uh, call to the floor um, uh, Domanitsky Andre to um, give us uh, his presentation about consular work in the service of the Hungarian Love Forum. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here to uh, speak about the Hungarian uh, diaspora in Australia, uh, in the southern Pacific, where I uh, worked seven years in the uh, 2010s as Council of Hungary, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me. So all Hungarians must be treated equally under the Hungarian law, regardless where they live. That was the summary of uh, the presentation, the previous presentation as well. So that's why we have to concentrate on the Hungarian diaspora everywhere on the world. And uh, that's why we have to concentrate uh, for, uh, for the consular work as well, because uh, on the uh, field work, the consuls uh, can have the uh, best position uh, to find uh, the problems to discover the problems, uh, to find the hot issues, and uh, maybe to help uh, the individuals and, and the Hungarian associations as well, to, uh, uh, how to uh, get support, how to get help, how to get assistance from, uh, from the mother country, from Hungary. So uh, that's why I'm concentrating on four uh, questions. The roots, uh, the Hungarian diaspora's history in the Southern Pacific, because it's very important. Uh, and mainly unknown for us, because it's very far, more than 20,000 uh, kilometers from here. Uh, and uh, this, have, this diaspora has uh, uh, deeper roots than we, uh, than we would think. So, uh, and then let's see how the Hungarian uh, diplomatic mission uh, network uh, was built up. Uh, in the past and uh, what's the present situation. And then let's see who is the, uh, the best man uh, for helping or for dealing with the, uh, the Hungarian diaspora's um, members and uh, the diaspora is uh, issues and matters within the, uh, the diplomatic missions and uh, whether there is uh, any uh, opportunity for the further development in this system. So uh, the Australia-Hungarian diaspora, Australia was a uh, penal settlement, uh, which was uh, settled in the late 18th century. And uh, some decades later, the first Hungarian as a prisoner <laughs> arrived uh, to the continent. So uh, the, that's why the Hungarian diaspora there uh, and the Hungarian minority group is one of the oldest uh, minority group in Australia because the first Hungarian uh, arrived as, as a convict uh, to Australia. Uh, some, uh, soon later, uh, some freemen, mainly merchants, uh, arrived and uh, they were freemen and the political refugees uh, arrived in the 1850s because of the uh, because of the gold rush uh, in Victoria, uh, which was the the biggest gold rush in Australia, and these uh, ex-soldiers, veterans of the uh, Hungarian Revolution and Independence War of uh, 1848 uh, and 49, uh, settled there uh, in Australia, and uh, others uh, others came in many waves, in several waves. Then, and uh, on the eve of the uh, First World War there were approximately 1,000 uh, Hungarians in Australia, mainly in Sydney and Melbourne, but in the, uh, uh, in the capital cities of the uh, Australian member states, uh, such as uh, Brisbane or uh, Adelaide or Perth. 20 years later, uh, on the eve of the Second World War, it was approximately 3,000 Hungarians in Australia. But uh, uh, the most important waves uh, started after the uh, Second World War, and we have to uh, mention four uh, important waves. First of all, the displaced persons uh, who, who came uh, between uh, 1945 and uh, uh, 1951. 
and the Hungarian freedom fighters of uh, 1956, uh, uh, both fled from the Russian army. And then the immigrants uh, from the socialist Hungary uh, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, the 70s and the 80s were the peak years of the Hungarian social, uh, socialist regime, so they were welfare refugees uh, from Hungary, but uh, uh, it was a, a, a quite big uh, wave. And we have to mention uh, the Hungarians who came from uh, Yugoslavia and the ex-Yugoslavian states because they chose Australia to settle there. And uh, it was a, a, a very long wave, started uh, in the 1950s and lasted uh, to the uh, 2000 because of the, because of the Balkanic war, uh, wars and because of the Bosnian wars and uh, Yugoslavian wars. So, uh, it's almost uh, uh, 10,000 Hungarians came from the uh, uh, Yugoslavia and the Yugoslavian states. So if we see the size of the Hungarian diaspora, uh, we can see that it's approximately uh, 60,000 uh, people. But uh, by including the generations of the uh, descendants of these people, uh, the, the current size is approximately uh, 100,000 people. Uh, the two main centers is Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, but uh, there are bigger Hungarian communities in uh, Adelaide and uh, Brisbane and Perth as well. Uh, but we have to know that uh, uh, one third of the uh, Hungarian community in Australia uh, uh, scattered everywhere. So that's why a council uh, uh, has to uh, see the whole country. So it's uh, the consular work that, uh, for uh, Hungary is, a, is an Australian-wide work. Work. Who belongs to the Hungarian diaspora at this moment? First of all, the Hungarian citizens, uh, but uh, both Australia and Hungary uh, allow, uh, uh, allow the dual citizenship. So we can see many uh, Hungarian citizens with Australian and other uh, countries' passport. Descendants of the Hungarian citizens, uh, it's very important. So the first and second generation who were born uh, in Australia, uh, because the immigrants were born in the old country, but the descendants uh, uh, mainly uh, were born uh, outside of Hungary. Uh, for the consular work, we have to, uh, uh, we can uh, make distinction because uh, if somebody came, uh, uh, came from Hungary, um, Hungary's current border, uh, uh, we have to, um, we have to uh, make the passport applications regardless, uh, regardless the Hungarian language skills. But uh, there is another uh, group um, who, has to, uh, who has to prove the Hungarian language skills as well. And there is a, a fourth group is the spouse of the Hungarian citizens. It's a very narrow uh, 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 group, but uh, there is a possibility that uh, a spouse with no Hungarian ancestry uh, can have the Hungarian citizenship as well. You can see the, uh, the uh, diaspora's uh, 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 composition. If we, uh, if we uh, meet the members of diaspora and if we uh, uh, visit the, the meetings of the uh, Hungarian associations, we mainly uh, meet uh, uh, the, uh, the immigrants who were born in the old country. And it, this is very important because uh, uh, these, uh, this group is uh, the majority of the Hungarian diaspora. The first and second generation who were born uh, uh, already in Australia um, have stronger ties to, to the new country than the old country. So we have to know this. Um, and, uh, and, and the last ties normally uh, can last uh, 50 or 60 years and then uh, after then, because these are the cu cultural ties, so for example, dancing, fencing, sporting, everything, scouting, uh, but uh, after the second generation, almost everything uh, fade away. What's the other side? This is the Hungarian state side, so we can see the, 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 the establishment of the Hungarian diplomatic network in Australia. The first uh, uh, consulate general uh, was launched by Austria-Hungary in Sydney, this was the first uh, uh, in the region in 1902. But the, uh, Hung uh, Hungary's own uh, hung uh, mission, the first mission, was launching only in 1968 uh, in Sydney. And uh, 
uh, with the strengthening of the Australian capital city Canberra, uh, many countries opened uh, uh, their own uh, embassies in, uh, in the Australian capital city, and Hungary uh, had, uh, had, his, had, had its own embassy in 1975. At this moment, uh, we have this embassy, and uh, we have two uh, consular offices in Melbourne and in Sydney. That's why we have uh, a three-pointed, uh, three-pillars network, a consular network in uh, Australia. And we have an embassy in New Zealand as well. So when we see the diplomatic mission staff, uh, we can see that uh, there are three larger groups uh, within the, uh, the staff, the diplomats, councils, and administrative staff. Uh, and uh, we should uh, uh, find out who would be uh, the best uh, uh, person uh, who can deal uh, uh, most easily with the uh, Hungarian mat matters and the diaspora matters from these groups. If we see that uh, the, the uh, diplomats, they uh, uh, concentrate on diplomatic matters, but uh, the councils uh, mainly deal with uh, uh, matters of the citizens uh, of the uh, of the sending country, so they are making passports, preparing citizenship applications, uh, making registrations of the newborn babies or uh, marriages, legalizing documents and uh, signatures. And there is a, 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 third, a third group, which is the administrative uh, staff, which ha have uh, no own authorization to deal with either diplomatic or uh, consular matters. So if we see these uh, uh, groups, we will see that maybe the best person, the most suitable person, uh, would be the most competent person who, uh, who meet regularly uh, with the members of the Hungarian diaspora, with the mem uh, individuals in the Hungarian diaspora, and this, is, this person is the council. So <clears throat> he has to, uh, he has to uh, 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 visit the, uh, the, the uh, Hungarian events, uh, he has to visit uh, uh, the gatherings, the parties, uh, and uh, uh, with the help of uh, his work, he has uh, up-to-date information about the, about the individual stories and uh, about the individual's background as well. So uh, for, for a, uh, uh, a person who uh, the, the most suitable person should be the most competent person, and this is the council. If we see uh, uh, the council work, uh, we can see that, uh, and this is the conclusion of my uh, uh, lecture, that what does Hungary do for Hungarians living overseas in the South Pacific? Uh, establishing a consular network, which uh, we could see that this uh, uh, had been done and uh, to facilitate the clients to uh, arrange administrative cases. Uh, we, have, uh, we have seen uh, in, from Balazs lectures uh, that uh, Hungary has a generous support scheme, both for associations and both for individuals uh, of the Hungarian diaspora. It is true for the Australian matters as well. What is the specialty uh, in uh, this region? This is a very far region from Hungary, as I mentioned. And that's why the proportion of the uh, electronic services should be increased, in my opinion. Uh, because, uh, because it's impossible to go back to Europe. And uh, that's why we have to, uh, we have to uh, increase, we have to develop uh, the, these, these uh, uh, e-services levels. And uh, we have to uh, find uh, uh, customary uh, ways as well uh, to, uh, to help the Hungarian individuals uh, to get uh, uh, user-friendly uh, services, for example, organizing consular centers or training uh, traveling staff and councils in this region. So, because uh, that, this is the, the, uh, the specialty of the Australian diaspora, um, uh, that, uh, as I mentioned, that many Hungarians live in countryside, so that's why we need to uh, see how we can have more for them. Thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say to you. As the beginning of uh, your presentation shows, uh, the Hungarians uh, love all these stories.
about uh, early uh, emigration waves. There are huge literature uh, of uh, Hungarian peoples arriving uh, overseas from the Austrian Hungarian uh, uh, monarchy. Uh, actually, it uh, remembers me uh, the story of uh, Ferenc Josef Debye, who arrived to South America more or less at the same time in the beginning of the 19th century and then composed the official hymn of Uruguay. And <laughs> even people in Uruguay remember him. So thank you very much for all uh, presentations. And uh, now I open um, the questions for the audiences. Do you have any questions for our panelists? Maybe I missed uh, how, how large is it when there's a If you ask somebody from the government, the answer, <laughs> the answer would be probably 500,000. And our Department of Statistics, which collected materials from the foreign countries, what they know about the <coughs> Lithuanian incomers. That would be like this. If you read the different books, uh, especially written by the diaspora uh, educated authors, you'll find maybe 1.5 uh, million of the Lithuanians abroad. Uh, according to our bureaucratic uh, tools of, of definition, mostly they would uh, count on Lithuanian citizen who left, would mean the third wave of our emigres only. If we, if we look for those uh, uh, diasporic self-definition numbers, uh, they are not uh, based uh, on very serious research. Some, some sort of uh, demographic deduction. Like, uh, deduction, I would mean like, uh, like, uh, like uh, one of uh, very prominent Lithuanian Jesuit from uh, Argentina, who is now acting in Lithuania, would say, that I, I, I would claim that we have uh, got about 300,000 of uh, Lithuanian descent people uh, in Brasilia only. It means that the clouds uh, and uh, not, not very clear uh, numbers. That's why my answer is also a bit of those clouds, not from straight statistic uh, reports. Just uh, following up, um, if I misunderstood that you can correct me, uh, you were talking about uh, the Lithuanians who migrated to Jerusalem. No, I, I, I didn't uh, uh, mention straight Jerusalem, but I mentioned that, uh, that uh, the uh, Jewish, uh, Lithuanian Jewish population was maybe uh, the first uh, active. Uh, uh, emigre flow from, from Lithuania starting from mid 19th century. And uh, uh, as I told, Lithuania in general in the uh, Russian Empire was very, very uh, strange uh, uh, and uh, mosaic uh, of, of different uh, uh, people. And when Jewish, Jewish population reached 12% of, of the state uh, or, or territory. Of, and uh, those, uh, those flows came, first of all, to the North America, both uh, uh, local Jews, Lithuanians and Lithuanians, but sometimes reached uh, South Africa together, again, together. Uh, the same, we could say, that Zionist movement, uh, or I the idea to settle uh, back uh, Palestine, also was uh, very often uh, discussed among uh, Lithuanian Jews starting from the late uh, 18th century, from Vilna Gaon, and all, all those ideas. But, uh, but later on in the diaspora, uh, Jewish and Lithuanian groups, they split it uh, as, as uh, distant, as uh, far from each other that they knew very little about. Uh, when you, you meet uh, some uh, professor in Cape Town who is working with the Litvak uh, community in South Africa, and you ask, what do you know about Lithuanian community, which was some three, 4,000 people between uh, Johannesburg and, and Cape Town in the early 20s, for example. And uh, they are so good in researching Litvak history in, uh, in South Africa, but they wouldn't know anything about Lithuanians, uh, Lithuanian, ethnic Lithuanians among them. 
when we speak with uh, our new, very decent uh, bureaucrats in foreign office, you'll uh, listen about the Litva community in South Africa with no mentioning that Lithuanians lived so in there. Diaspora is very, very diverse, uh, very um, split, and, and uh, you know, uh, as I told in the beginning, uh, the challenge is uh, old, but still very big, and uh, we don't know the answers uh, to very many of those challenges. We are trying sometimes manage unmanageable. So thank you, gentlemen. Uh, each one of you uh, had a riveting uh, presentation, and I can speak only for myself, but I'm sure I am uh, reflecting the sentiments of everyone here. This, this was really uh, extraordinary. There's so much information. I learned a great deal. I have a question that is not directed to any one of you, but in fact to all of you. And I think it's one of the great challenges of anybody dealing uh, with diaspora communities, and that's the linguistic one. And you, sir, for example, um, you share your experience in Australia. My question is that over time, one may expect that the members of the Hungarian community in Australia or the Lithuanian community in Britain or Brazil, um, they are, of course, going to marry uh, people of other ethnicities. I don't think um, that's unusual. I think it's uh, probably inevitable. The question is, have you done research on to what extent the language is preserved among successive generations. So in the case of, uh, let's say, a Hungarian, a Hungarian uh, second generation woman in Sydney, and she marries someone of an other ethnic community in Australia, to what extent is she able to uh, continue to propagate the use of the Hungarian language or the Lithuanian language? I mean, the case of Turkey is rather different, I suppose, because it's a much bigger block of people, uh, let's say, in Germany. So it's, it, it may be um, not quite so challenging. But that's one question. And the other question is, if such research has been done, I would be curious to know whether you can discern a difference between cases when the mother is the speaker of the language, able to uh, inculcate the successive generations of the language, or the father. So in other words, if the father is a Hungarian speaker or the father is a Lithuanian speaker, is that influencing the ability to pass on the language to successive generations? That's the, what, my question, but also, um, all of you alluded to this, what can be done to burnish the efforts to keep the linguistic identity? Because my suspicion is that uh, after a couple of generations, once the language be, is, is uh, less used or perhaps not used at all, it becomes more and more difficult to retain the uh, ethnic identity without that component, because I think the language is such a significant and serious component of the identity of, of uh, ethnic communities in different parts of the world. And you know, when I spoke yesterday also, I alluded to this, the embrace of the wider society, uh, especially in a democratic country where, let's say, Hungarians or Lithuanians are not facing any discrimination, there isn't any antipathy from the surrounding population, so it becomes very easy just to sort of melt into the, into the wider community. According to my experience, this is the question of the living grandparents, uh, especially the grandma who can't speak in English. That's the crucial question in, uh, to, to, to answer to you. So if, uh, because uh, both, of, normally both of the parents work, 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 work regularly, and they have no time to teach. That's why, uh, in my opinion, this is approximately the 10% 10, uh, 10 of the Hungarian diaspora I have met. So it's approximately 10,000 Hungarians uh, uh, during the seven year consular work. So in my opinion, uh, when I see uh, a, a child, uh, can, uh, can, uh, can learn the language, the Hungarian language, in the family approximately at the age of five. And after then, uh, he has to, she has to uh, learn the English. That's why many Hungarians, when, uh, when visits me, uh, 
I try to uh, speak to Hungarian, and uh, if I can, uh, if I uh, can make a, 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 a make the uh, make a, a familiar uh, a friendship uh, uh, between us, uh, they they start uh, start uh, speaking in Hungarian, and this is a, a child language. That's why, because they have a uh, they have a language. Uh, uh, knowledge uh, around a five or six year old uh, kid. And uh, the another important uh, uh, specialty that they can't uh, write and read, only speaking, only speaking. And, uh, but this uh, uh, skill uh, can be traced uh, uh, until the uh, first generation. And uh, it's very rare in the second generation. And uh, for the second question, uh, I ha uh, have to uh, uh, tell you that uh, it depends on the uh, it depends on the personality of the uh, uh, of the uh, parent, mainly the mother. But if the father uh, uh, has strong connection to the Hungarian history, to the Hungarian culture, uh, firstly the the daughters. Can, uh, can learn Hungarian, in my opinion, uh, because uh, there is a very uh, 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 deep connection to the fathers, daughters, and between fathers and daughters. And if the fathers, uh, father has strong connection to the country and uh, wants to teach the daughter, uh, usually the daughters uh, 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 learn the language. But you have to know, and this is my last sentence, you have to know that until 1990s in Australia, uh, English was preferred. So uh, within the mixed families, Hungarian, uh, in many times, Hungarian was banned uh, to, to teach by the Hungarian uh, parent. That's the situation. Thank you. Um, just one uh, very short addition. Um, in mixed families, is as far as I'm aware, um, and especially in, in the the marriages where the other one is from the majority uh, population, um, it it is up to institutions. So if there is a chance that there is a, a weekend school, there is uh, there is a crash a kindergarten in the in the other sort in the Hungarian, then there is a chance a better chance of preserving the language. In case, and of course, that that would uh, channel into um, Hungarian education, especially in the surrounding countries. Um, whether it's mother or a father, I don't know. I'm maybe more mother, but I don't think it's it's more than a than an that is it would be real real empiric uh, evidence. Um, on the other hand. Um, all these these uh, coordinated and institutionalized uh, ways of, of using the language of meeting uh, meeting others meeting peers then it's it certainly is something which which can help and uh, maybe just one addition um, in our family we have a lot of a uh, lot of uh, family members living here and there in the world and they all preserved Hungarian their children are losing it most of them uh, but in the, especially in the in the older generation, so who are now in the, their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, it was remarkable to see that those who read Hungarian, they spoke perfect, perfect Hungarian, living in the U.S. for example for 50 years, whereby some left the country, lived there for 10 years, and were already speaking in a very strange American accent. Uh, so it is. It is reading is something culture is something which is which is very important and peers I believe for the children peers and that's why I also put on the the Salzburg thing if they can speak to peers in in their mother tongue uh, that certainly helps. We don't have uh, confer confidential dates about uh, the, the whole population. So when we are researching, we always uh, 
uh, can have just uh, focus uh, groups or um, deep interviews or uh, some uh, statistic uh, research, but not with representative samples. So um, I, I think uh, uh, from a scientific point of view, the, the more confidential data that you have is through the uh, diaspora organizations that have experiences uh, with, uh, about working with these people. And if uh, a family don't have any um, connection to these institutions, it's very difficult to preserve uh, the cultural and linguistic heritage because uh, it's a general uh, process that in the second or uh, third generation, uh, the language of the main society will dominate in the family as well. Thank you. Uh, I would say that uh, almost everything uh, what was said uh, answering this question fits for Lithuanians. Uh, if I would choose Southern American example, uh, it would be very attractive to, to, to follow the line of the self-identification. Uh, this is uh, some sort of end of the world where the new Lithuanian-speaking emigres uh, were uh, not coming after 1990s. End of the world, I mean like uh, Argentinian people sometimes smile or joke about Patagonia, for example. Southern Patagonia, Chubut province, where uh, the Welsh, French and Lithuanians settled in the end of the 19th century, maybe the same time when Jules Verne published uh, those uh, kids of the Captain Grant. And a couple of years ago, we uh, had some expedition in that place and we made a documentary. We, me and uh, my friend, uh, non-budget uh, effort, uh, and the title for that was Lithuanian Mother of, or, or, or the Traces of Patagonia. And uh, the hero was a woman uh, who founded Lithuanian Museum in, in uh, that province. She had no drop of Lithuanian blood, but she claimed she's Lithuanian. Why she's Lithuanian? Because she is a mother of Lithuanians. Her husband was Lithuanian. They were not speaking uh, Lithuanian. The majority of the uh, Lithuanian community in Argentina or Brazil or Uruguay, only the leaders of the community sometimes uh, make Lithuanian language as the symbolic one. Language is local. But what uh, identifies them? What uh, uh, are the uh, other frontiers? Would be music, dance, and costume. And gastronomy, yes, exactly. And some heritage, heritage of the social structure from the 20s of the 20th century when Lithuanian government uh, put some, uh, some schools for those economic emigres. Those schools uh, later just were converted to some uh, restaurants, some, uh, some, some community houses, and uh, um, uh, NGOs uh, who were the owners of those places survived in that social economic uh, uh, um, uh, uh, shape. But, but they are so conscious and so proud, sometimes joking that they love Lithuania even more than we speaking so nicely uh, own language. It means that, uh, but when uh, we uh, approach to the public uh, or, or policy or diaspora policy, which is not so, so well, uh, well uh, organized uh, uh, as I, I hear from, from the Hungarian present, presenters, I came here with curiosity, we live with jealousy, that's that. <laughs> but what, what I would say uh, that according to my uh, um, uh, perception, uh, Lithuanian policy is based exceptionally on ethno-linguistic reasons for that education. Uh, uh, weekend schools and teaching Lithuanian language. Sometimes teaching with no understanding or, or proposing some, some methods of teaching with no understanding of the uh, uh, education forms of the countries of immigration, without understanding that uh, this language, this native language will be second or even third language, maybe uh, sometimes uh, symbolic language. 
but not uh, that uh, th this younger generation will use in the future. And usually I say, for me, memory is much more important. Memory not only of uh, the Lithuania native country, but memory of the previous diasporic communities with those stories about, about the first uh, Hungarian Australia, the same with other diasporas and own stories. If you listen or you read the Lithuanian uh, histories of American Lithuanians, wow, you would find them from Trinidad or Tobago, from, uh, from uh, Caribbean pirates uh, from that time, from the first Latin school in New York or New Amsterdam, who got the founder, Alexander Cursius Lituanus, uh, beginning of the 17th century, or the first uh, fort uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the delta of Amazonia, fort uh, constructed by the uh, Dutch, fleet and Admiral Arceszewski, who was Lithuanian and was the architect of Birzai Castle. All those stories they consume, even if it is just the ideas, just the symbols. But that means that uh, memory and genealogy, that feeling, that, uh, that tiny family history uh, becomes much more important. And, uh, but somehow when, when uh, our, our uh, Ministry of Education, which is responsible for that uh, field of uh, support of diaspora, sometimes you tell them, sometimes propose to read books, I even wrote specially a book which would be a sort of pretension to be a textbook of Lithuanian history, but history told as the uh, diasporic nation with those uh, events, uh, adventures, all that. No answer, no, no acceptation, and I don't know why. Thank you very much. I, actually, Eric Hobsbawm said that uh, the reinvention of the origin of a group is a beginning of the modern nation construction. No, <laughs> and thank you very much for the uh, romantic. In this <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for the presentation. I know that we are out of time, but I think coffee break is one of the most important parts.